Hello and welcome to Let's Talk Education. I'm Randy Barber, the Chief Communications Officer for the Boulder Valley School District, and I want to welcome you uh, to this show. Uh, as you know, this is our opportunity to talk to district leadership in regards to important topics in our schools. As you know, on uh, Tuesday night, we announced plans to return our secondary students to phase four, that's in-person learning four days a week, starting on Tuesday, March the 30th, following spring break. The timing allows us to ensure that all of our in-person teachers and staff have the ability to be fully vaccinated before they before we expand in-person learning. And with declining cases in our community and these vaccinations, uh, we are able to ease some of our social distancing to make this possible. I know that that's been a big question that we've got today. So I've got uh, some friends on the phone uh, on the call today to help us answer some of your questions. Uh, but I do want to mention that currently our secondary schools, middle and high school, are in phase three. That's hybrid learning in which students uh, attend two days of, of in-person and then have three remote learning days. Again, this change would bring them to four days in-person learning uh, and then that one asynchronous day of, uh, of uh, uh, remote learning uh, when that happens in, in, at the end of March. Uh, to give us some insight into this announcement, this big announcement, I'm excited to welcome back Superintendent Rob Anderson. Good afternoon, Rob. How are you? I'm doing great, Randy. How are you? I'm doing okay. Uh, this was a big announcement, uh, and knowing the importance of in-person learning uh, for students, and I know that you've been an advocate from the very beginning and trying to get our students back in the classroom. Uh, talk to me about what this means for you. Really excited. I, I think a long time coming, a, a, an announcement with much anticipation. Um, we were actually make, able to make this announcement a week earlier than we had originally projected. Uh, you know, I think that we've committed early on um, since this pandemic has happened. Once we know uh, what we we need to know, once we have the information, we're going to share that with our with our public, uh, with our community, with our board. And so, uh, we're excited to make this call a week early, um, and what it's going to mean for our students by being by coming back right after spring break. They're going to have, especially our second secondary students, they'll have they'll have a whole nine weeks in person. Um, which really, because of our block schedule, equates to a semester of in-person learning in those classes. And so really excited for what that means for our kids and for our teachers. And I know that um, in my conversations over the past week that everybody's just really thrilled that we've been able to make this happen. I know that this, is, again, is something that we would have liked to have had happen immediately or you know, throughout the entire year, but we really needed to wait for the conditions to be right. Um, and, and with the teachers being vaccinated and that going, uh, you know, we were really worried that there wouldn't be enough vaccinations given kind of a the, the struggles that, that the state and the, and the nation were having in that, uh, not knowing for sure what cases were going to look like. I mean, so far, thankfully, everything has been going super well. Yeah, I would say that, you know, a, a few weeks ago when we said we were going to make our announcement uh, in the first week of March, uh, we were being cautious, right? I mean, you know, I think that there were, um, th that that's the right approach. Uh, we wanted to make sure the vaccinations certainly came in. Um, and listen, the governor, um, has delivered um, on his promise to support schools. And so we were excited that those vaccinations um, were coming in at projection where the weeks prior, uh, the vaccinations that that our local um, you know health providers were requesting were coming in much under what they had requested. And so that was one trend. And that was one of the big trends that really allowed us to announce a week earlier. And then the new variant um, and looking at how that's impacted community cases, our community's done an awesome job. They've, they've um, continued to uh, follow the, the guidance of, of our health experts and have been masking, social distancing, all the things that we know um, keep this keep this pandemic um, at bay. Uh, and so those things really helped us out to, to make that announcement and earlier. Um, again, just really, really excited and thankful for our community for their patience and working with us um, and just really excited for March 30th. It's, it's amazing to think that this we were actually about a year out from when we were just starting to take action as a school district. That, like we had heard about our first case in, in Boulder County. Uh, we were holding our first meetings to determine what we were going to do. And then, you know, it's been about a month from now is kind of when closures happen and all those crazy things. Um, can you believe, A, that it's been a year? And, you know, what, what all have we learned in, this, in, in the course of all this? Maybe the longest year in the history of years, if the, if there is such a thing. It is. It has. Uh, I can tell you that I know that our team have have worked at least a year and a half and a year's worth of time. Uh, the amount of time, effort, and energy that we've put in, um, most weeks working, you know, sixty hours a week to try to a stay in tune with the information and develop plans and contingency plans to to make that happen. Uh, we have learned a lot. Uh, first and foremost, you know, the resilience of our of our educators, of our community, of everyone to be able to pull through this together has just been inspiring to me. 
Um, and, and again, I can't thank our teachers, our leaders enough for everything that they've done in meeting the challenges during during this pandemic. Um, and I think that there's things that, that as, as we move forward, hopefully post pandemic, that we'll continue to, to leverage and utilize. I think that our teachers learned and our kids learned different ways to in, in which they learn best, right? And um, abilities uh, to, to leverage technology, to connect with one another, um, to work, not just, you know, communicate, but work in groups and, and, um, and, and you know, turn in assignments. And, and you know, you know the, I think there's a lot to learn um, in that regard. Uh, and I, I also think that we've also learned uh, to appreciate, uh, you know, the value of teachers being in front of kids. And that's something I don't think anybody in this generation will ever take uh, granted for again, uh, take take that for granted ever again. So, yeah, there's no doubt. I think all of us have a new newfound appreciation. Teaching our kids at home has been incredibly difficult. And um, in fact, that was my next question is just regards to, you know, th there's no doubt that this has been a rough year for our educators, for our staff, um, for our parents as they've as they've really come to the aid and try to help their kids learn at home. It's 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 been tough. Not easy, right? I think that um, everybody's done the best that they can. You know, I don't. I, I I genuinely believe that, and I know that a lot of our families are very excited for us to get kids back in person. And I know um, that that we have to a make sure that when our kids start to come back, that they're okay. You know, making sure that we're checking in on their social emotional well being, um, and then also checking in on what what kind of supports do they need academically. Um, I would say that, you know, that's, that's something that we've talked about. I'm not sure if we've talked about that on this show, but certainly in our board meetings around how are we going to provide the extra supports that kids need, not just through the rest of this year, but over the summer and all into next year. Because uh, I think school's going to have to look a little bit different as we think about filling in those gaps if they, if they exist. Uh, but just, again, I'm so appreciative of, uh, of the efforts of, of our families, educators, and pulling together and, uh, and looking forward to, to uh, having everybody back in person March 30th, four days. We did get a question uh, from uh, one of our parents uh, this afternoon, and I, I wanted to pose it to you. It, it's really the idea, while we're still dealing with the pandemic, uh, you know, things are starting to kind of look like normal. And one of those questions is about CMAS. And I know our Board of Education has taken action uh, on this in, in the form of a resolution. But let me go ahead and just read this message from Alicia. Uh, who has a, a student over at Manhattan. Uh, she asked, uh, in your recent email, you said that kids are already overwhelmed. Uh, so why are we going to go forward with CMAS testing? Um, and I think, again, the, the, the statement that we were trying to make is, and our board made, was that we would really rather not have testing this year. Do you want to talk about that? And then, you know, obviously, kind of what we where we're going from here. Absolutely. You know, a few weeks back, our board uh, passed a resolution asking the state to pause on CMAS testing this year. Um, and in that resolution, you know, we we talked about the reason being that the in, in, you, there's never been a higher cost to pay to give these tests, right? In, in person instruction right now is at a premium, right? We know every day that we can be with our kids is incredibly important, and um, we also know that um, that as we think about um, what these tests will tell us, there's it, there's limited things that, that they'll tell us, right? They're not diagnostic assessments. CMAS is designed uh, to measure learning in a typical year, not in a pandemic year, right? And so I think that there will be limited uses for the data that, that we gather um, and, the, and the value that that gives does not equate to what we'd have to give up to, 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 provide, to give those tests, which is the instructional time. Uh, so, um, unfortunately, um, you know, the uh, we've been waiting for the federal government, U.S. Department of Education to really weigh in on whether or not states would be able to waive out of CMAS and um, or state testing. And, you know, earlier this week, it was determined that there would not be any blanket waivers. I think there's legislation moving forward in our state that we support that uh, would, would, you know, continue on this path to, to ask that our state ask for a waiver to the extent that is possible. Um, um, from from federal government, so uh, we're, we're supportive of that. But we also know that we uh, it takes time to to prepare to give these exams, and so we have to prepare as if we're giving the exams because we don't believe at this point that we have a guarantee that we're not going to be able to give them. And so that's the communication we tried to send out. Uh, you know, kind of a tricky message to give, which is we don't we'd rather not give the tests if we have to. We need to prepare now, um, and there's still a ray of hope that somehow, some way. Um, through legislation that we could get the the state of Colorado to ask uh, to waive out of um, having to give those, uh, but uh, 
uh, we have to prepare as if we're going to we're going to move forward. And I think that you kind of touched on this, but you know, both when it comes to testing and when it comes to the the, the response to COVID nineteen and the way the vaccinations are put out and all these different things, a lot of folks, um, you know, have looked at us and have, have asked, why can't you just, you know, sort of be a maverick and just, you know, do whatever you want to do. If you know that it's the right thing, just go off and do it. And, and you know, I think that's important for people to hear that, that we are in a, a very regulated industry in which we really, you know, have to follow the guidelines that the governor sets in, in, in law, you know, in terms of uh, health, uh, the health uh, guidelines, um, the health orders. Um, you know, when you think about testing, those are federal laws. You know, applied at a state, you know, at a state level. Um, these are not things that we can just, um, you know, take for granted or just go off and do our own thing. And and sometimes you might see cases in which a uh, superintendent out there, and I won't name names, but you know, where somebody does something and then you know end up, you know, that that they have to kind of retract that a little bit and maybe that doesn't necessarily get the you know the the as clear of coverage as the big announcement that they made um but again this is and i don't want to you know act as if we have no uh, ability to do anything but but really there are certain areas where that's not in our control right yeah so i would say that there are pretty hard guardrails in regards to how you have to operate as, as a as a public school system Right. And those are guardrails that you have to stay within. And I think that depending upon the topic, you know, you may rub up against the guardrails every now and again, but you have to stay in the guardrails and stay on the road. Right. And so, you know, we we just try to make thoughtful, level headed decisions and try to be um, create right the, the right processes um, in which to follow to make really good, solid decisions. And so, you know, depending on the topic, you know, I think that as we think about this coming back four days a week and why we're able to do this now, uh, we made a commitment, the Board of Education and I made a commitment very early on that we were going to stay in line with the recommendations of local health experts, Boulder County Public Health, Broomfield Health, and that we weren't going to make decisions that would veer from where they were guiding us, right? And that served us incredibly well, um, you know, in the sense that, that we've kept people safe, that we've been able to inch forward with more in-person instruction as dictated by the community cases and, and other factors that we watch closely. Uh, not everybody has taken that approach in our state or in other places. Some folks have said, we're not gonna listen to the health guidance and this is what we're going to do. And those folks have had more person in-person learning um, and that's worked out in different ways. Uh, but again, we, it was important for us to say up front what we were going to do and then follow through with that, right? Promises made, promises kept, and that's exactly what we've done. And so, uh, again, I think that it was the right or the right way to move forward. Um, certainly, we're not health experts here at school districts, um, and we respect um, and honor those folks that, that have put in as many hours as we've had, and maybe even more, in trying to make sure that they're steering us in the right direction. Uh, for, we'll be forever thankful for Boulder County Public Health and Broomfield Health and all the guidance that they've given us. Right. But I would say that, you know, Randy, in a in community, people are free to, to have their opinions. And there are some folks that question why we why we had to do that. And, um, you know, the theoretically, we didn't have to do that, but we committed to doing it up front. And I think that that served us incredibly well. Certainly a little sure. bit of risk there if you, if you go off on your own, if you're not an expert in that field. Um, my last question really to you is, I think we're, you know, uh, very uh, ho ho hopeful at this moment. Uh, obviously, we're bringing our students back. We're thinking about next year already. Uh, we're thinking about how we can support our kids that have been heavily impacted by this. We're thinking about coming back in a five-day schedule next, next, uh, next August. Um, you know, what do you want to say to people in regards to the future here? Well, I would say that, that um, first of all, I'm incredibly excited. I think we all are um, as we think about the rest of this year and next year that, you know, that we, we, we commit to being there for our community like we've always had. You know, your, you know, your kids are coming back to incredibly talented teachers, great schools, caring individuals. You know, we're, we, we are committing to support the whole child um, academically as well as socially, emotionally. And, and you know, the, the level of supports that we build in next year will be more robust than it's been in the past because we feel like that we're going to have a lot more work to do. So we're going to continue to commit to making sure that we're supporting all kids. You know, I've said this several times, Randy, you know, if, if you, you know, we're not going to fix this in, in the summer, right? Even, and we're going to have a more robust summer school this year, but even extending the, the school year a week, two weeks, that's not going to cut it. Right? It's going to take us at least a year of continuously assessing and monitoring 
and providing the right level of supports for all of our kids and families to get us back to where we need to be. And we know that. And so, you know, there's a long road ahead. Um, you know, if it takes you a year to kind of create issues, it's going to take you at least a year to, to work on those. And so as we think about next year, that we will continue to keep our focus. You know, when we, when we show up in August, it's not going to be like, oh, everything's fine and great. And we're moving forward like we did um, two Augusts ago. School will be different and, and kids will have more supports. We, we work on, we're going to be working on having more supports for teachers, more supports for families, because we feel like that's the, that's what we need to do. And it's the right thing to do for our kids and community. And I would say, I would feel uh, some regret if I don't mention that, you know, we have been very thankful to the way that the governor's approached this, that he's prioritized public education. Um, I know that when we look out at, at our colleagues in other states and that kind of thing, uh, you know, many have not, are still in remote learning. Um, you know, we're, we're very thankful that we're able to be in the place that we're at. Thankful for a couple of things. First of all, I think the governor has shown exceptional leadership and has shown, um, you know, that he's truly a friend to public education with whether it's, you know, providing the testing that we're using through COVID check, whether it's moving up the vaccines, um, you know, continuously thinking about how he can, can support us through CARES Act dollars. I think that he's just done an incredible job. I can tell you the school superintendents across the country are jealous of the supports that we're getting in Colorado. I would say the final thing that I'm really thankful for is, you know, this is a tough time, right? There's emotions have run high. Um, and I watch in other communities and, and in other states where this pandemic has actually torn communities apart, where you have parents and teachers and school boards and superintendents getting pulled apart. And I would say that we've done a really jo great job of working to hold everybody together, right? That, 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 um, and that's a, that's a tribute to not only our teachers, BVEA, our school board, our district staff, our community leaders. We've been able to pull this pull together I think in, in a good way. So as we move forward in August, you know, there's th that we're all rowing in, in the same direction, right? Uh, and so as we think about, and that's, I think that that's special because in a lot of communities that has not been the case. So I'm just incredibly thankful for everybody for hanging tight, locking arms as we've weathered this just incredibly difficult storm. Well, thank you. Um, is there anything else that you wanna say as we, as we close up here? Uh, again, thanks, Randy. Thanks to everybody for on the call. Thank everyone for your patience and understanding as we've moved forward um, and uh, and just looking forward to uh, the fourth nine weeks um, and, and as we move forward. So and have a great weekend, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for your time on a Friday afternoon. I ho hope that you have a good weekend as well. Um, I, I do want to pivot, and uh, we have one more special guest that I want to talk to today. Uh, we asked uh, Dr. Urbina, uh, who is with uh, Broomfield and Boulder County's public health departments, to join us. Uh, good afternoon, Chris. It's always great to see everyone on Friday afternoon. Uh, my Friday afternoon is actually my busiest day. I get a ton of phone calls, uh, usually closer to five. So thank you <laughs> for those phone calls. <laughs> Why? Well, thank you for joining us. I, I know it's always busy in the communications office as well on Friday. So uh, I appreciate everybody for joining us. It's it's not necessarily the best time to have a have a show for sure. Um, you know, I do want to thank you for coming back on Let's Talk. And and you know, as you and I have talked about before, uh, you know, we have a, a, a layers of health prote protections that have really kept our kids safe. Um, you know, one of the most frequently asked questions that we got this week, as you might guess, is in regards to the fact that we are looking at, as part of this transition, easing some of our health restrictions in terms of distancing. Um, and so let me, uh, I'll bring in a couple questions that we've gotten. Um, actually, um, okay, here it is, distancing. Uh, I would like to know specifically, this is from uh, Melanie from Bear Creek, how the schools will address social distancing in classrooms. The CDC mentioned maintaining a distance of six feet. And clearly that's not possible in the classrooms. Um, you know, uh, one of the other things that she said is it feels very much like distancing measures and recommendations by CDC and Fauci are, are being glossed over and minimized to suit the district. Um, you know, we obviously uh, saw that CDC report that came out recently. Uh, we're very well aware that uh, at best case scenario, you know, you keep uh, six feet or more distance, um, you know, because that is a factor that can help keep people safe. But um, in our other schools, we have, uh, you know, uh, uh, limited that, that distancing. And as long as they've got masks and those kind of things, we still see a low amount of transmission. What would you want people to know in regards to this? Randy, thank you for asking the question. This is a frequently asked question, not only in our community, but also in the schools. So I'm glad we can address this issue. As I've looked back and we've looked back at the multiple studies that have done on physical and social distancing, as you know, this is a respiratory spread 
the virus uh, and it can be aerosolized. So all the mitigation strategies, you can't really isolate one mitigation strategy versus the other. You really have to look at the entire package. So we're talking about masking, we're talking about physical distancing, we're talking about washing your hands and disinfecting services. The, your schools have done an excellent job of increasing ventilation in the schools. We're, we're talking about cohorting. We're screening kids before they come to school. So we're encouraging kids not to come to school sick. You expanded testing. And now we've added uh, vaccinating all the teachers who want to get vaccinated. So if we look at that entire picture, uh, that is a very safe uh, as safe as possible to actually have come back to school. So we're supportive both from Broomfield and Boulder to looking at, at the schools to say, help us with controlling transmission in the schools. And I think you've done a great job. And so by putting all those layers of protection in, in place, I think we can reduce the risk of spread. Can't really look at one of those factors. Now, let's look at that one factor. <laughs> I looked back at the studies and there have been multiple uh, meta-analysis of multiple studies that talk about a range of distance. Obviously, six feet and greater is better, but three to six feet is still it lowers your risk. Um, so, so I think it's okay to reduce the the the, uh, the distance. Uh, and I know you're going to maximize it when six feet when you can, but three feet is probably okay with all the other mitigation factors in place that we can actually reduce the risk of infection in the schools. I'm actually more worried about extracurricular activities, you know, in terms of kids not wearing masks, uh, not physically distancing at all, and so particularly in some sports, and then, and then congregating and connecting together outside of school. And I'm more risk, and I look at the data, you know, two-thirds of all infections that are brought to school are probably coming from extracurricular activities. So I think we need to place the emphasis on protecting kids in our community as we continue to make schools safer. You know, I know that, um, you know, another thing that a lot of folks have talked about in the community is in regards to the fact that uh, our counties, as the cases have dropped, you know, have, have moved uh, in level. Uh, Broomfield now is in, in level blue. Uh, Boulder is in level yellow. And so that does, you know, equate to similarly to what's happening for us. Um, you know, changes in restrictions. And so, you know, allowing folks to come back together in, in restaurants and those kind of things. A is, is I mean, this is a kind of a similar situation in which you see things are getting better in the community with community spread and you see that things are working quite well with, with health precautions. And so, um, you know, some of those things can be lessened. Um, and then, you know, two, again, this is no time to let down our guard. If we want to keep kids in school, you know, even though these things are being lessened, the more that we can do that, if, if you're in a situation in school and you can't be distanced, great, let's do that. Um, if you're out in the in public, you know, this is no time to drop off that mask and, you know, flip it out there. Like, we want to continue to be careful because, you know, and, and a lot of our cases have been exactly what you've said from club sports or we are seeing more in our athletic programs as well. Um, this is all very important, right? Exactly. And I think I'm glad you emphasized that. Now, that was the connection I wanted to make is that spread comes not just in the schools, it comes from our community. So as we can lessen spread of the infection in our community, as we continue to wear masks, physical distancing, avoiding social gatherings, of, of if still wearing your mask out in the community, and we get more and more people vaccinated, parents, grandparents, you know, uh, uh, other workers, and I and noticed the governor just announced you know, an expansion of the, of the vaccine to other workers, we're going to reduce the amount of virus in our community. That coupled with our mitigation strategies and that natural immunity that comes when you get the infection, hopefully we don't want anybody to get the infection, will actually create a better environment for not only workers and our community members, but also the schools, because there's, there's an overlap. The schools are not isolated. They, kids go home when they're not in school and parents go to work. So I think those connections are very important. So we need to not let down our guards. And I'm particularly worried about, and you see this national news about the variants. You know, we don't know what the trans, it looks like a couple of the new variants uh, are more transmissible. So I think we need to pay, pay attention to that uh, and make sure that we continue to use our, our masks and physical distancing so we can stop the spread of the new variants. If you don't have a virus, in your community, it can't mutate. It's as simple as that.
And I know that we're going to continue to be in close consultation with you. Uh, we're going to be all be monitoring that that situation. You know, if things if things change, and I think about what happened with in last fall with CU, where things really spiked up. Um, you guys were intimately involved with the university and really working with them on on looking at specific things that could really change the situation. Some of that might have been impacting classes, but some of it was about off off campus activities as well. I mean, that's that's essentially what would happen here as well. If we start to see an increase uh, either at schools because of something that's happening here or you know in the community with the with the variants going around, this is not like we we've made a decision and we're not, you know, we're not looking back at it. We're going to constantly evaluate, right? Oh, you're on mute right now. Some would say we're probably too intimate with CU, you know, in terms of that, the mitigation strategies that we put together. And that was a very aggressive move to say we have to stop this spread. And I think we did. You know, it was tremendous, the collaboration with uh, teachers, uh, the school uh, administrators, uh, our restaurants and, and, and enforcement really made a difference. We don't want to be in that situation again. So now we've learned a lot, and as Dr. Anderson talked about earlier, we know how to prevent the spread of this virus. We know what conditions. So we, and we also know the data. We watch very closely the transmission in schools, the transmission in communities. And so we monitor this. And, and as you know, we give updates to the schools in our community on a regular basis, weekly. And so anybody who wants to, they can go to the website uh, uh, bouldercounty.org and look at the data and you can see the trends going down but we're not satisfied that just because the trends are going down we need to let up our guard we have to pay attention to that and i'm really glad the schools are continuing to to be supportive of that of monitoring the data making sure that they continue to have the mitigations and uh, it, plans in place because this is really a partnership not only with uh, uh, the schools but our community as well and I know I've heard you say before, but uh, with the variants, the same protections uh, do work, uh, wearing your mask, uh, you know, social distancing, et cetera. So you're kind of encouraging people to do that. I, I do want to mention as well um, that our employees, again, uh, we're very excited that we have the third uh, vaccine clinic going on this weekend. Um, as you guys look out in the community, um, you know, I know that there's been really great results with your 70 plus uh, efforts. Um, we're really making some strides in terms of vaccination. We, we've certainly gotten that question about you know, that that doesn't turn somebody to be superhuman here. And, and <laughs> you, know, you know, it's not a complete protection that that there's still some ability to spread a disease or that kind of thing. This is just one more layer of, of protection, correct? Yeah, these are great questions, you know, and these are common questions in the community. So I'm glad you're bringing them up here. You know, the, it's not a it's not a get out of jail uh, free card. It's not a I can do anything I want when you get your vaccine. The The vaccines have been shown to show, uh, prevent moderate and severe disease. They're not 100% effective. They're very effective. And I think that's a good goal, uh, particularly in, in high-risk folks, uh, that preventing those moderate to severe infections. And it's likely to prevent transmissibility of the virus. If you have a strong immune system that fights off the virus from entering your system, that's a good thing. But it doesn't. It's not a hundred percent. So that's why those mitigations factors that we continue to uh, to uh, mention are still important. And we don't have the entire population vaccinated. So and we don't have the vaccine for children yet. So I still think that the virus can continue in our community until we have you know a significant number of people vaccinated and we have the vaccine then for children. Then I, and all the mitigation factors. That's really what will protect us all. So I'm glad you keep on, you ask these questions, they're tremendous, and, and that, that, that's insight that I think people need to understand. You know, to a certain extent, it, it, the analogy that I would think of is you got a, you're, we're playing on a soccer field, and as these vaccinations happen, we're really kind of closing off part of the field, right? That sure. there's less uh, space for that virus to sort of play within. Um, and so, like, when we think about our 70 plus, the, the issue there is trying to make sure that we don't have high hospitalization. And Correct. Everyone, if you have a car accident, you can't get space in a hospital bed, you know, where they're having to make these awful decisions, you know, medicine wise. Um, same thing's true with the, with the, you know, the employees that if, if they're protected, then they can not be quarantined at that point. I mean, there's a lot of benefits there, uh, right? Absolutely. You're not only protecting yourself, uh, you know, from moderate to severe disease, you're also protecting your family members, your co-workers by reducing the amount of spread. I like your analogy of, 
of having a, a smaller and smaller soccer field. Now, if everybody in that soccer field also wore a mask, then we'd be much better off, you know, in terms of getting everybody vaccinated and doing all those prevention strategies. You know, the virus is looking for a host, you know, and, and when, when somebody coughs or sneezes and it's not trapped in a mask and you're close, or you're hugging, or you're not washing your hands, then that virus can spread to somebody else. So that vaccination is a critical piece, but it's not the only piece. As we talked about when your first question came on, all of these factors are important. Everything that we're doing, whether or not it's in the community or in the school, is important to stop the spread of this virus. Um, I, as I mentioned to you uh, right before the show started, we did get a question from uh, someone in the community. Uh, this is from Sammy, uh, who has a, a student at Centaurus. Um, she asked, you know, wouldn't it be better to go back in person two weeks after spring break in order to mitigate any travel and potential COVID exposure that might happen over the break? I know that we got similar sort of questions um, after the holidays. Uh, I'd imagine, and, and all the way back to Halloween, and I remember every time we've kind of had one of these situations, what is your best advice to folks and, and what would your advice to the, the, to the district be as well? Sure. You know, again, we're talking about degrees of risk. I think if people pay attention to, and they do go on vacation, they go and visit, they go to the beach or they go to wherever, if they continue to wear their mask, if they continue to, to uh, uh, have physical distancing, to avoid large crowds, uh, to, to wash your hands frequently, to do all of those mitigation factors, uh, those are good things that will protect you whether or not you're in Boulder or in Grand Junction or even in California. W the issue is about preventing it, transmission of the infection. The CDC has some very good guidelines. Uh, their recommendations, um, obviously, uh, we're, we're encouraging people not to travel if they don't if they don't have to. But if you absolutely have to travel and you do want to do those, if you put those mitigation factors in place, that you're going to be protected whether or not you live in Boulder County or you're traveling to another folks. And and particularly, I'm concerned about people visiting their their grandparents or their aunts and uncles who may not have been vaccinated. And if they're not vaccinated, that's even more important that we, uh, we put those mitigation factors in place for all people in, in general. And I think if you follow those guidelines, uh, you can safely travel. Um, but again, it, that's only if you need to travel. I don't think that it's absolutely necessary. Uh, you know, I, I would love to go and do things that I had prior to COVID. But you know, I think reducing risk is a good thing. And if you're, particularly if you're somebody elderly like myself, over the age of 65, then reducing my risk is probably a good idea. So, um, I, I also want to just give you an opportunity. Is there anything I didn't ask you that you want to talk about? <laughs> no, I just always want to be complimentary of Dr. Crespo, Rob, you know, uh, Rob, Rob, Dr. Anderson, you, Randy, who've done a really tremendous job of getting communication out to the community, of answering these difficult questions. You know, there's no right or wrong answer. You know, but I think our collaborative efforts, you know, have just been tremendous, and I applaud all of your efforts. You guys are doing a great job to make uh, our Boulder Valley School District uh, safer for our children, and and all the efforts that you put on in our community are, are just tremendous. So keep up the good work, and let's get those kids back to school. That is, uh, I, I think we couldn't be happy to hear that from you, and uh, we, we feel the same way in regards to our partnership. I know that uh, Dr. Anderson has said that in our board meeting that, um, we know that you know the work that you guys have done have really is a good part of the reason why we see that that downward trend in in our numbers and and the fact that a lot of you know that there hasn't really been that spread in our schools is because of the feedback that we've that we've acted upon. Dr. Abina, uh, thank you so much. I hope you have a great weekend, and we'll let you get back to your work. Great, um, thank you. Thank you. I do want to mention real quick uh, before we open up uh, to the. Uh, uh, to the rest of our panel today that we are accepting questions today. Uh, if you do have any questions that you are hoping to share, um, the link is bit.ly uh, slash ly let's talk. Can everybody see my screen here? Let me just make sure that it's bigger. Um, and so- we uh, Randy, we can't see it. You cannot see it. Okay, this is a mistake okay. I make often as I try to make my screen larger. Um, let me see if I can get back. I'll just read out the link and then I'll try to get it up later once we get into some questions. But it's bit.ly, that's B-I-T dot L-Y slash Let's Talk BVSD. Um, and so those that's that's where we would want you to send uh, your questions uh, this afternoon if you have any further ones. And we'll, we'll be asking that of our the remaining panelists that are here, uh, which I, I cannot thank enough for joining me on a Friday afternoon. We have uh, uh, Area Superintendent Margaret Crespo who oversees uh, the southwest part of our school district. Hey, Margaret. 
Hi there, Randy. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And I've got the Assistant Superintendent of Operational Services, Rob Price, as well. Good evening, Randy. Hey, Rob, how are you doing today? Fantastic. So we have gotten a number of great questions, and so I'm going to just dive right in if you are okay with that. I think we got a lot of great, you know, a lot of great ground covered already with uh, Dr. Abina and Dr. Anderson. But uh, you know, obviously there, there's a lot of questions that come up when these things happen, and so I'm going to just dive into. Uh, let's start with uh, as we tr transition. Is it possible for people to move between things? And so I'll read a couple questions that we've got. Uh, uh, first from Jen, uh, she has some students at Meadowlark. Uh, her question is in regards to my seventh grader is dreading returning to school more days a week because he sits in the same class in the same seat all day and all of his classes are online except for PE. Uh, how will we return to four days uh, uh, change the synchronous learning situation for middle school students in a high high flex situation? So I think that the concern here is obviously when you've got students that are at home enjoying uh, that makes it that people are a little bit more glued to the to the classroom. Uh, Margaret, what would you want to say to folks in regards to, to how we're trying to handle that? So I would um, definitely say that if you feel like as a parent, your child needs to be moving more and needs to, and you're not necessarily comfortable headed back to school, I would reach out to your principal and talk a little bit about some options, what can be done to make it a little bit more active so that um, maybe we build in breaks, similar to what we do when we're in school full, full time in person. Um, we work with our teachers and our principals so that the students get more breaks consistently throughout the day and they don't feel like they're attached to the chair. Even in the current circumstances, we know there are ways we've learned over the past year to um, to find solutions for that. So I would definitely reach out to the principal and uh, and then through the um, area executive director if um, if necessary. Although I doubt that would be the case. Um, our principals are really working hard and our teachers are really working hard to meet the needs of our kids. And I know that uh, we actually had a session with teachers just the other day about outdoor learning. We are trying to encourage, uh, even with the thought that we would have kids that are online, of how can we get classes up and moving and and outside and you know all the, you know it's a, w a wonderful space to be able to work in because there's as much ventilation as you could possibly ask for out there. Um, not you know, and I'm sure Rob can talk about the amazing ventilation work that we've done in our schools. But um, you know, so I, I know that that's a constant part of our conversation right now. I do also want to hit on a couple other things that we've gotten in regards to to again options for people. Um, you know, the idea of you know, can people stay remote? Uh, we just got a question from Louisa from Monarch. Uh, similarly, uh, Karen from uh, Monarch K8. Uh, will online school be available after spring break for students who are not comfortable to return to school four days a week? Absolutely. We certainly want fa our families to feel comfortable about coming back and what that looks like and feels like. Often when talking to our principals and teachers, they feel more comfortable and are able to come in if that is not the case and that's they're still not feeling that way. Certainly our principals and our teachers will work with students. Uh, we understand that this situation is um, is precarious and we wanna make sure that our staff and our students and our families feel comfortable and safe. So uh, definitely again, reach out to your building principals to talk them, talk to them about what are the strategies they're implementing, what does that look like, um, and then what happens if that's not, if you're still not comfortable as a parent. Um, similarly, uh, again, I've got a few of these uh, line of questions, uh, staying in hybrid. Uh, Leela, uh, from, uh, who has a, a child over at Boulder High School, um, asked, the hybrid model of two days a week of in-person learning works really well for my daughter and our family. Can we choose to stick with that schedule after spring break if BBSD goes to phase four um, uh, with students attending four days a week? Um, she said specifically, she wanted to share a little bit about uh, her exam, uh, of her situation. You know, uh, it's a little bit easier two days a week because uh, she's worried about with four days a week, you know, the, uh, the student having to wear their mask, you know, all four days. Um, already she comes home with headaches a little bit uh, from dehydration and not being able to drink enough water with that mask on. Um, you know, she just wonders if, you know, if, the, if that's a possibility. And that's something that we want them to talk to their administrator about. Is that right? Absolutely. And I, what I would say is, of course, we want the flexibility, but we wa also want to make sure that we are able to cover the needs of students at home and in person um, with the ex with the existing systems that we have for staff. So um, I would definitely reach out to um, Dr. Hill and just have a conversation or the counselor about what are some options and, and what can they work toward. Uh, of course, we want our students to come back four days a week. But we also recognize that there are circumstances that they may, that may not be possible, um, and it's just helpful if your administrator knows so they can walk through um, what those options look like and uh, how to resolve issues and problems together. And I could imagine at the high school level that probably involves a teacher as well. You know, you know, absolutely, quickly. counselor, teacher, um, and principal. 
I would definitely reach out to all three. Thank you. Um, this is another question uh, in uh, in regards to high school um, with the new with the new plan here. Um, it's a uh, Azure who has a student at uh, freshman over at Fairview. Um, she asks, um, uh, "Will the remainder of the year look like uh, the way it has been, in which students continue to end their day so early?" Um, you know, it sounds like it's hard for her to come and pick up her child at the end of the school day because uh, the child's getting out as early as one twenty. That would probably be. And, and oftentimes what our, our suggestion is is really to work on the school level because that sounds like a specific at Fairview and maybe a specific to that student's uh, schedule, but anything further that you'd wanna say there? I would definitely reach out to the counselor in that situation. There, are, I know that there are situations where Fairview has some students based on scheduling that are leaving a little bit earlier or dismissed earlier, but there are always options for the student to engage. Um, and it may just be that they're not um, necessarily aware of what the options are or they haven't been researched or maybe um, there has to be a switch to something. So I would definitely reach out to the counselor first to figure out what options there are because we certainly don't want our students feeling like they uh, don't have options in school to stay there. The other question that I'm trying to find the actual question to, but I'll just I'll just say it out loud, which is the idea of, um, you know, of course that opportunity. Maybe a, a family decided because it was two days a week that maybe it wasn't worth it or whatever, and we've heard that, right? Um, but now that it's four days, they're like, ooh, I'd really like to come back, or you know, it's tr the same thing for remote only students. What what does that look like, uh, you know, uh, for for students? That's again, it's something that they should talk to their school administrator about, correct? Yeah, so I'll start with the um, students that are specifically in Boulder Universal right now, I would reach out to the administrator there uh, and talk to them about what that would look like. Because at this time in the year, to think about moving back when we're headed into the fourth quarter, definitely will have some challenges for the student. Um, and then additionally challenges in the school for the school piece. If they've been remote all four days and been in, their, in the building, um, over time, I do. I would definitely reach out to the current building principal because a lot of the um, mitigating factors that we've put into place and a lot of the schedules that have been put into place uh, might not fit for the students' um, experience going in for fourth quarter as well. Uh, again, our schools are totally willing to work with all of our families and find as much accommodation as possible for our kids coming in four days a week or wanting to stay too, but it's definitely a building uh, decision situation just based on their needs, their staffing, uh, their building uh, availability. So I would, again, and I feel like a broken record and I'm really sorry, Randy, but that's definitely what I would say is start with the building principals first or the counselors. So again, just to recap what you were saying is that, you know, if you're in, in, uh, in remote or in hybrid learning and your kid's going two days a week, they will automatically be uh, planned to be four days. If you would like that to be hybrid, talk to your principal. If you've got a student that's been learning online with their school, with their peers in the classroom uh, via Revis and all that, uh, the camera and all that kind of thing, again, talk to your principal. They might be able to make accommodations there. If you're in Boulder Universal, that's a, a, a much tougher uh, request because it really takes an admin transfer and, and those two things aren't necessarily one and the same. They, they might have a rougher transition to make uh, at that yeah. point. Yep, and if I can say that really the Boulder Universal transfer, the the alignment of the systems is not the same, so it's really not fair to the student. It's They're, they're literally switching experiences um, close to the end of the year. So that's why I think it's imperative uh, that they have that conversation and we go through a process about moving the child. Perfect. Thank you for going through all that list of questions. Uh, I know very similar in some ways, but I think you can get a much better picture for kind of what the options are here. Um, Rob, I do want to turn to you. One of the, the second part of one of those questions was really about transportation. That that family that was talking about, you know, having to pick up our child at 120, and then she had some other days that were like 235 because of choir. Um, we got a, a number of questions in regards to transportation, and so um, I'll just go ahead and, and and that was, you know, she said, you know, right now there's no transportation. Um, uh, similarly, we got a question from Lori, who has a, a Fairview sophomore, who said, after spring break, are they going to offer bus transportation to our high school students? Uh, it would be very inconvenient to get my student from school otherwise. Uh, what would you like them to know? Yeah, Randy, I would start by saying, just to give you a little bit of background, um, the challenges we faced over the last year, specifically in operations. So operations consists of a number of departments, food service and transportation specifically, uh, to name a few. But, you know, since the start of the pandemic, we've lost over 20% of our bus drivers. So when you put that in terms of numbers, that's over 50 bus drivers. Uh, 50 positions that we haven't been able to fill. And just to be, um, just to be clear, they haven't died. No, 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 no. Just people that have left. Yeah, yes, good. Sorry. Yes, no, 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 no. 
Um, I'm glad you made that clarification, Randy. <laughs> but you know, people that have decided to go to different industries, uh, people that haven't felt comfortable, et cetera. Uh, so those are 50 positions we have in the middle of fill. And then we still have restrictions on our buses. So you know, our capacity is still about two thirds of what it was pre-pandemic. Um, so right now, we, you know, we meet uh, on a regular basis with a, with a large team to continue to uh, troubleshoot and problem solve this issue. We recognize it. Uh, right now, we've been committed to transporting all of our special education students and pre-K through uh, eighth grade. It is highly unlikely due to the shortage, due to the restrictions that we'll be able to offer transportation this year for general ed, uh, general education high school students. I'm, not, I'm, I'm saying highly unlikely, I'm not losing hope. I still hope that we can continue to get people. I'm gonna use this opportunity as a plug. Hopefully you've seen our advertisements on our buses, on our website and our social media campaign. Um, if you are interested in being a driver, if you're interested in working food services, uh, please visit our website. Please reach out to me and I can put you in touch with the right people. Uh, we, have a, we're, we have a dire need and we're not the only school district in Colorado or across the state that are fighting this. Uh, but right now, that's where we're at, Randy. It's highly unlikely that we'll be able to offer high school general education transportation this year. And I know that we've been talking to, uh, to our health uh, officials and trying to see if there's any sort of movement there, but I appreciate that update. Um, similarly, um, we had a question from Jared, uh, who is a freshman at Fairview High School, who asked, has BBSD worked with RTD to increase public transportation scheduling options for students after spring break? As of now, the schedules are reduced to a point that is extremely difficult for students to get to school using RTD resources unless they spend an inordinate amount of time on the buses. Um, uh, return to normal RTD schedules around town would be very helpful. It, um, Randy, I guess this is the good news to share. Um, RTD staff has agreed to restart the 206 route in South Boulder for the uh, morning and afternoon peak trips. And then they've also agreed to add an additional morning trip to the, TO, uh, to the 204 route in North Boulder. And I, I I think this just shows the great partnership we've had with RTD, just like uh, Boulder Valley School District. They have, they have a shortage. Um, they have restrictions on their buses. We continue to work with them. We continue to brainstorm ideas. You know, right now we're looking at an area in North Boulder where we can run a shuttle bus from a certain community over to an RTD stop to get high school students on that. So. Um, I would say, parents, if you've got ideas on and and want to be part of this solution, please reach out to me. Uh, we are open, um, and that's how we came up with the shuttle option was through a parent that that reached out and threw this idea out there, and it's going to work uh, fantastic for the gun barrel area. So uh, please continue to send those ideas. That's how we get creative. Um, but right now, I'd say the partnership with RTD has been fantastic, and I'm just happy to share that good news. And I, and I know that we take it very seriously. Uh, I think our, our wish and hope, as you kind of said, was you know that we, our students can ride the bus. We understand how important that is and the equity of it for our students. And so again, that's gonna be something that we continue to push for. Um, while I've got you, I do wanna ask you as well a question uh, in regards to testing. Um, we got a, a request or a, a question from uh, Mel Banders. Uh, she's uh, got a student at Bear Creek, she wrote, this is more of a suggestion, but I think it would go a long way towards helping students feel better if you perform testing once a week uh, when you have all students back in, in to show that you are actively trying to catch asymptomatic cases. And she mentions, you know, we obviously do those daily health checks, but, um, you know, we have to rely upon the truthfulness and the and the and and the follow through of parents there. And so, you know, there there's a question, a fair question in regards to whether or not we might be missing folks that that don't check temperature plus. Uh, I know Stephanie Farron would tell you too that that a temperature check is not necessarily doesn't necessarily equate to finding somebody. You can be asymptomatic, and especially when children, you don't necessarily have to have a temperature. I know your staff is looking at how we might, especially with this change for social distancing, how we might be able to incorporate more testing. Yep. The uh, so right now, what we are looking at, Randy, is standing up screening testing. Um, you know, CDC just came out with a recent report talking about how valuable it is in areas uh, that have moderate to high levels of community transmission. And that's exactly where we're at. So with the move to uh, four days a week, specifically at the secondary level, 
Um, starting March 30th, we plan to begin random weekly COVID testing at all of our schools. So right now you might know that we have uh, two mobile testing sites that go out. They're able to hit a school about every two weeks. And then we have a uh, large community site out of Centaurus. And all of this is possible through a relationship or partnership with COVID Check Colorado. Um, again, our governor has continued to fund this uh, for us. Um, and it's, it's been a great, well, as we talk about our layers, and a, a great layer for us. But, you know, starting March 30th, we'll begin weekly random testing. Uh, we'll have optional diagnostic testing for people experiencing, experiencing symptoms um, that will still be offered. All of this, I just want to talk about, it's voluntary. Um, and we do require parents to sign a consent before we actually perform the testing. So additional information will be coming out to parents and families and our staff over the next few weeks. I would encourage families to take advantage of this opportunity. Uh, you know, in order to be this, for this to be successful, we're gonna need over 40% of our students to opt in. Um, right now we're right at about 7%. So, uh, but you know, if we're gonna try to reach some goals of testing a, a good proportion of the number of students that back in, or back in the buildings, um, we're gonna need uh, students and families to opt into the process. So, but more to come, um, we're gonna be pushing out communications uh, for our own communications department through COVID check, um, all in uh, a partnership with Boulder County Public Health and Broomfield. Thank you for all that. I mean, just to mention, our testing to this point has really been sort of a backfill to make sure that places that haven't had testing nearby, like for instance, uh, Boulder offers some testing and some other parts of the county have had testing. We obviously have our location in Centaurus, uh, at Centaurus and Lafayette uh, through COVID check. Um, but this was to try to kind of fill that in. This, this move would be to expand that. So I just wanted to be clear about that as well. Yeah. I do want to just uh, pose a question to you also about, you know, I know that a lot of consternation in regards to to high school students moving around the hallways, you know, uh, it, it, there's no question. I think about my kindergartner that got to go back to four days when that all happened. Any sort of idea of kids keeping separation is is sort of laughable in that situation. And I think we're we're very cognizant of similar things in high school. But the question has kind of come up of what additional safety precautions? Um, what would you want people to know? I know our buildings are certainly yeah. this right. I think, you know, Dr. Urbina explains it really well is it's, we're not just, it's not just about social distancing. It's not just about masking. It's not about screening. It's not about testing. It's all of that put together. So that's where we put a, a significant focus on all of the layers that we have out there. You know, we've increased ventilation. We put air purifiers in our classrooms. We continue to clean at a really high level desktops and doorknobs, all those high touch surfaces. Um, you know, we promote, uh, physical distancing as much as possible. So, you know, we continue to encourage that. A lot of our traffic, when you look at the way principals are bringing students in and having students exit the building, the way they're uh, uh, going down corridors, et cetera, there's a lot of thought that has been put into that process. You know, as we're bringing kids back into the building, specifically at our high schools, and that's why we've been hesitant to bring kids back. We have smaller classrooms and a significant amount of kids in these classrooms. So. Um, you know, we're not going to be able to hit the six foot social distancing with four days back with students back four days a week. Um, and in some cases, it's going to be hard to maintain three foot social distancing. But that's why we have all of these other layers in place to protect everyone. I, I know <laughs> before about ventilation, I know that uh, our buildings actually we've done a lot of work on our indoor air quality. Um, and also we've really worked, you know, A, to address things like what you're talking about, where we know that there's a bottleneck or whatever work with the buildings there, but also to encourage schools to offer outdoor lunch, you know, if that's a possibility, if the weather's good enough. Um, a lot of thought in regards to the, to the actual um, layout of lunch rooms and how they might use that most efficiently. There's There's been a lot of support. Plus, I just want to mention before I forget it too, that our staff continues to have access to, you know, KN95 masks and the shields and all those things that we've had, um, that continues to be part of this effort as well. Yeah, no, Randy, you hit it well, and uh, you did an excellent job at leading the uh, weekly wake up with our teachers. I don't remember if that was earlier this week or last week, but um, I left inspired. Uh, we have a lot of energy in this community to be outside, which we should. We've got a beautiful place to live. Um, so, you know, that you, you know, we're always challenges, right? With weather, if you would have tried to do some outdoor learning yesterday with the snow that we had or 
Um, you know, always a challenge, but yes, we are encouraging uh, teachers to get outdoors when they can, and we know it's safer outdoors. Uh, but again, all the layers you talk about, we do believe it's safe uh, indoors also. Um, you know, we're tracking that. We're not seeing level high levels of transmission in our building. So, you know, I think again, it's we've got a lot of tools in the toolbox uh, to keep everyone safe and keep everyone in school also. Martha, I do want to give you, uh, you know, we, we have had some questions in regards to what this will look and feel like, um, you know, as, as they come back, will the bell schedule be changing? Uh, you know, what do you expect that things will look like in classroom, you know, kind of just uh, uh, kind of dovetail up to what Rob was just talking about there. Um, what do you, what do you think that this will be like when, when students are returning? So um, I think that as Rob mentioned, we'll be doing all of the mitigating factors that we're doing um, through the end of this year as well as going into next year. We're planning in that direction, hoping to return five days a week, certainly, but recognizing that um, this current situation is not going to necessarily disappear over the summer. People will still have to get vaccinated in the general community, as Dr. Urbina said. So um, we would anticipate coming back five days a week, and that's what we're planning for, um, and certainly keeping those systems and structures in place so that we can keep our kids and our staff safe uh, and our community moving forward. Uh, one of the questions that we got from Molly, who has a seventh grader, was, does this phase four eliminate cohort model, meaning all children are back at the same time? Those two things are actually kind of separate questions. All students would have that opportunity, and I think it's, what, about 70% at a middle school level that are back? Yeah. 74 something like that um but we still are keeping cohorts so that we can quarantine and we're we actually have the ability to target uh target contact trace so that hopefully we don't have to have an entire school or entire grade out or whatever that kind of thing right yep absolutely as we've come back at elementary we've learned a lot around social distancing with seating charts and trying to keep the space available um, and knowing where the students are sitting our health services department with in partnership with the health departments have done an incredible job of being able to be very specific around who's sitting near you who were you near what did that look like so that we can make sure that when we're sending students home we're sending home the minimal number um, and, and does that always work? Absolutely not, but at least it's helpful for us. You know, sometimes we send more kids home than we need to, um, but it's really all about safety and making sure that our kids are um, safe. So one of the things that we've had high success with, and I'll say that again, is our seating chart use. That's incredibly helpful for our families to be able to keep their kids in schools and for our teachers to be able to feel safe and connected um, while remaining in school. I know that we got um, gotten questions in regards to Mondays. Um, we did in the announcement, um, we were pretty clear on it, but I do wanna make sure that I address it. Um, at this time, uh, through the end of this school year, uh, we plan to continue to have Mondays be an asynchronous learning day. Um, do you wanna kind of talk about what the reasoning behind that is? Sure, absolutely. So one of the things that I wanna say um, really clearly is that our teachers have done an incredible job of giving up a lot of their typical plan time during the week. I think about middle school teachers when when we first went into this circumstance, the, the time that they use to plan for their lessons, um, the plan that all of the data that they look at, all of that was impacted, uh, especially at middle school because they wanted to make sure they stayed connected to their students. And then the same for elementary and the rest of our secondaries, our teachers, um, do all of those meetings, all of those IEPs, all of those um, typical teacher things when students aren't present are done on that Monday. And we wanna make sure that that's available so that we can meet, meet the needs of all of our students um, through those conversations, through that planning, through that collaboration that occurs on those Monday days. Um, and additionally, I'll share that in order for us to uh, remove that Monday, um, the entire system, and, and I think it's, it's difficult to understand that we have like so many buildings and every time we make a change in the system like that, that would remove the Mondays, it actually impacts the entire um, system of education within the district because all of those changes have to be recorded and changed and a lot of them have to be done manually. Um, so it's both perspectives and just honoring the work that uh, we have our teachers doing. Um, I mentioned to you, we got a question about athletics. Uh, the question was from Kathleen, who has a student at Monarch, um, asked, will uh, athletic competitions be open to spectators soon? Will students, uh, you know, have to stay home uh, with that option? Um, my understanding is that, uh, the, that the public health departments have eased some restrictions. And so depending on the sport that they can have some spectators, but some of yeah, that I can I can jump in on that one, Randy. Um, right now, we're following uh, the state's guidance. They have guidance for indoor and outdoor events. 
Um, the number of spectators is limited and limited significantly. So, uh, and it's all based on the size of the venue. So, you know, all of our gyms vary a little bit. So I would say uh, you would have to reach out to your specific school to get additional information on how they're allocating tickets, et cetera, to those venues. Um, but yes, we are starting to allow spectators at indoor and outdoor events. Um, and, we'll do, and I think this moment, Rob, because again, so much thought had gone into like at the elementary level about uh, eating, but uh, I know we kind of talked about it, but what do we think that uh, lunch will look like at our high schools? Is that, I mean, that's probably a very school by school situation too. It really is. And, you know, it's really dependent on how many kids are eating in the cafeterias, et cetera. I believe we are allowing open campuses. So some kids will be leaving um, and then other areas, you know, I know the principals are thinking just outside of the cafeteria, encouraging kids to go outside and eat, um, use, utilize other spaces, et cetera. So again, you know, all of the uh, layers of protection are in place. We put air purifiers in those spaces because we know kids will be removing their masks we are encouraging physical distancing in the cafeterias, um, you know, hand sanitizer stations, that type of stuff, Randy. So uh, a lot of thought has been put into that, but, you know, we're really encouraging, you know, kids to be able to maintain that distance in the cafeterias. Um, I do want to do more of these questions that we've just gotten in. Uh, will students still have to wear a mask? Yes, they will have to. We kind of talked about the la layers and that remains there. We're going to continue to wash, ask kids to disinfect and wash their hands. We'll continue to clean the classrooms, disinfect. Um, obviously the ventilation continues. We'll continue to cohort all those uh, health precautions. We're gonna continue that daily check-in. We were talking about the five days. I know that the plan is to come back, hopefully if all things are, are good uh, in August, uh, five days a week. Um, and part of that too is the, the high flex, right, Margaret? Like we have our teachers trying to teach both remote and in-person students, but next year, uh, those students will be moving that want to remote only will just be in BU and BU link. So that, that really will, will uh, resolve that issue that will allow us to come back five days. Yes. Okay. Just wanted to make sure I was right there. Uh, this is a positive one, Rob. Um, I, well, it's positive because I know the answer to it. Um, is school breakfast and lunch still free? Yes. Through the end of the year. And that's and a hope. I have to give full credit to the USDA. Uh, that, I mean, this is not something that uh, that we probably could have afforded on our own, but it was made possible. No. It, yes, it's all possible at USDA. They've made a commitment through the end of the school year. We all hope they'll continue it uh, into the future, Randy. Um, you know, I, I want to say I want to take this opportunity, Randy, just to continue to say thanks uh, to everyone in operations, uh, food services team since the uh, started the pandemic have been real heroes. We do these food distribution days and I don't care if it's rain, snow or shine. I mean, they're out there every Monday and doing a tremendous job. And we also have community liaisons that are delivering food to people's homes. Um, but there's a lot of people struggling and I'll tell you, I get a lot of uh, fantastic emails, um, you know, phone calls from parents that are so appreciative of it. So I just want to say thanks to them. I want to say thanks to our drivers that have stuck with us um, through this pandemic, all of our custodial staff that made ha has made this happen and, and our maintenance staff that continues to make sure our systems are operating. So I, I just appreciate, I wanted to take that opportunity, Randy, because we've got some great, great people in this district. And uh, I don't want to make sure we miss out on some of the people that are behind the scenes doing this great work. I appreciate, I appreciate that. that. This, I mean, it is awe-inspiring when you look around the school district. We've got more than a million uh, meals, you know, and they're continuing to serve those on Mondays. Uh, everyone is welcome. I, you know, it's it's both for those in need as well as, as everyday families. Um, again, any student can participate in that free breakfast and lunch at our schools right now. We want you to try uh, Chef Ch uh, Stevens' uh, uh, lunches and, and, and breakfast. Uh, they are outstanding. Um, it's a great opportunity to do that. And I, and I would also just continue that thank you to you know everyone else, our paras, our teachers. You know, I'm going to miss somebody if I if I if I go down a full list. But just everyone has been working so hard. Um, and and to also, and I know we're a little over time here, but I want to uh, mention that you know we were talking about the KN95 masks. That's something that the state's fi helps finance. We mentioned the COVID Check Colorado, something that the state helped finance. Oftentimes, I think people look at uh, us and go, okay, 
uh, you know, the, the, the world, you know, the sky's the limit in terms of what we can do. No, I mean, we operate in a budget. And so when the state's able, when the governor's able to come through and provide us that kind of thing, or the USDA is able to provide us funding for the for lunches, um, you know, we want to make sure that we reflect that outside. The air purifiers were made uh, possible through a grant, and we know um, some families had, had really tried to start that in their schools, and, and then that grant came through to make it possible everywhere. And so I just want to recognize all that. Um, I also just want to take a quick moment, and I know, again, we're running long here, but Margaret, um, we've been working hard uh, with our team to try to also think about targeted support for our students. Um, we talked a little bit about summer effort. Um, I know that there's some efforts on Monday right now. Anything more that you want to share on that? And then I'll, both, I'll give you both a chance just so you can be thinking about it uh, for anything else. Last words uh, as we close up today. <laughs> So I'll do it all at once and I'll share that our catch up. Um, first, I wanna just say thank you for everybody's patience. Certainly as everything that we've learned through the pandemic, it, it's up and running. And I wanna thank the teams that have worked on this incredible work internally to get it launched. Our um, community schools staff, our internal staff uh, in all of our networks. We've been able to launch Mondays now and we've got um, our K-12 process going. We've got high school drop in, our middle school online and our elementary schools are coming in for tutoring. And starting on Monday, we're really excited to be able to open two schools, uh, two middle schools for tutoring and uh, more to come on that on the website that is at Centennial and Angevine. Uh, we're very excited to um, launch at Netherland, our ACT. So every week that comes on, we keep adding and we're going to continue to add through the rest of the year. We're working right now with some of our partners um, and our internal staff through health services for social emotional support at the high schools on Mondays to add workshop sessions because um, we know that that's a need. And then that that will continue through the summer. Our, our summer um, expansion this year, our summer programming is different, but definitely focused on the needs of our kids. And then that will continue. As Dr. Anderson said, this is a two to three year haul from here. Um, and we are committed and working hard. So I would say thank you to everyone who's been patient. If you have questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to your principal, to my office, to, school, to uh, community schools. And then the last thing I'll say in closing is just, um, I can't thank this community enough uh, for all of the ideas, all of the support. We get emails saying thank you for all the great work that we're doing our staff across the system both internally external partners um, if anything this pandemic has absolutely proved that as a community we will come together when we have a need and I'm just so grateful to be part of BVSD so thanks Randy thank you Margaret and I would be remiss not to mention that impact on education has been a huge help to us uh, they are uh, our primary partner when it comes to fundraising and so for the the catch-up plan as well as some of our efforts around uh, food uh, uh, distribution in addition to that USDA, they were they were a huge help right up front on that. Uh, backpacks to students, I mean, it's just endless in regards to that. And if you wanna give, I think, uh, I, I look up the, the, I think it's impactoneducation.org slash donate, but just Google it, you'll be able to find it. Um, Rob, I do wanna turn to you and give you that last last word as well. Well, you, Randy, I, you know, what ditto what Margaret said, I can't say it any better. Um, just thanks for everybody's patience. You know, I personally feel like we're starting to feel or starting to see a light at the end of the tunnel. I know we got a long ways to go. And I know that the 21, 22 school year is going to look very similar with the health precautions, et cetera. But getting students back four days a week is something we've been trying to achieve for a long time. Getting our teachers vaccinated or staff vaccinated was huge. Um, so as we're working towards that, but I can't tell you, there's nobody more excited about having kids back five days a week, including my own kids. So um, that's what we're all shooting for and striving for. We know what's best uh, just to see um, our athletes back out on the court. You know, um, I was back, I was at Centaurus High School the other night and it felt so normal, more normal than it has in the past year. I can assure you of that. So it's feeling good. Uh, you know, I just thanks for everybody's graciousness um, and, and just we'll, we'll hang in there together. I like what Dr. Anderson said, that we're all coming together, locking arms as we're moving forward. I really feel like that's where we're at. So thank you, Randy. Nice job tonight. Thank you. And I do want to mention, I think Rob, out of everyone, was cheering loudest when the spectator rules changed. Uh, he's got a daughter that's in basketball. And um, I do I do want to mention that, you know, we we all uh, largely have families, uh, you know, that in the leadership team. And so we're constantly thinking about, you know, how, how we can improve. Uh, we're always thinking about kids are always on the top of our minds. And um, I just want to thank you, our, our viewers, our, our constituents, uh, our families and employees that are tuning in today. Thank you for having this conversation with us. Thank you for joining us for Let's Talk, and I hope that you have a great weekend. Bye-bye.